In this video, our discussion will be about the pyramidal tracts, and we'll also discuss about hemiplegia and UMN or LMN lesion for first MBBS. So we begin our discussion with the descending tracts. We have said in our earlier video that the ascending tracts are the sensory pathways, whereas the descending tracts are the motor pathways. So roughly there are two uh, classifications or categories of tracts. The first one is our important one, which we'll discuss in this video, which is the pyramidal tract. And along with that, we have the extra pyramidal tracts. Now, this is a diagram where we'll draw the different tracks. So our pyramidal tracks, so we, this, our motor tracks descend from the cortex all the way downwards into the spinal cord. And the first track, which we are going to discuss in detail in this video, which is our pyramidal tracks. So our pyramidal track, it starts all the way down from the cortex into the spinal cord. And in addition to that, we have some other extra pyramidal tracks. So the first one, the one that extends from the red nucleus in the midbrain to the spinal cord. So this is the red nucleus. And this is known as the rubrospinal tract. It extends from the red nucleus up to the spinal cord. Then we have a second tract, which extends from the superior colliculus all the way down into the spinal cord. And this is a superior colliculus. This is the tectospinal tract. It integrates between our visual sensations and our motor system. And then we have the vestibular nucleus at the junction of bones and medulla. And that will give rise to the vestibulospinal tract. Vestibulospinal tract. Then at the medulla and at the pons, we have the reticular activating system, which will send sensations to the spinal cord and that will form the reticulo spinal tract. So all of these tracts apart from the corticospinal tract constitutes the extra pyramidal system. So this is our corticospinal tract, which will be the main tract which we'll discuss in this video. Now what is the function of the pyramidal tract? The pyramidal tract actually extends from the cortex all the way into the spinal cord and it is responsible for the fine voluntary movements. So that's the important point which we need to re realize. That is the fine voluntary skilled movements are brought about by the pyramidal tract. If there is any injury to the pyramidal tract, then we will be unable to perform the skilled movements. What about the extra pyramidal tracts? All of these range and constitute our extra pyramidal tracts. These extra pyramidal tracts, what they do is they will modulate the function of the pyramidal tract. So the pyramidal tract, as it goes through from the uh, cortex to the spinal cord, it actually has connections with all of these tracts. So the pyramidal tract is connected to the rubrospinal tract, the vestibulospinal tract, the reticulospinal tract, and so on. So they all work in coordination, and the rubrospinal, reticulospinal, vestibulospinal, they are all involved in making sure that we can carry out. They help to maintain the posture, as well as they help to make sure that we are able to perform fine skill movements. For example, suppose right now I'm writing on my iPad with a pen. So the corticospinal tract is responsible for the fine movements of my fingers for writing, whereas the other tracts, that is the rubrospinal, reticulospinal, and vestibulospinal tracts, they make sure the posture that is maintained, the degree of tone, the muscular tone that is required for the other muscles, such as our shoulder muscles, the head posture, all of these things are maintained by the extrapyramidal tract. So there is an interconnection between these two tracts. Now we'll discuss in this video in detail about the pyramidal tract. So we begin here with the figure of our brain. And I have drawn here a few colored shaded regions. Let me explain this. So in our frontal cortex, we have this central sulci which will divide between the sensory and the motor areas roughly. So posterior to the central sulci, we have a sensory area and that is actually the somatosensory area where the sensory sensations eventually end up uh, from the spinal, from the receptors, they will ascend up to the sensory cortex. And just anterior to the central sulcus, here we have our primary motor area. So this is the area which is involved in the fine skilled movements. And in the Broadman's classification, this is area 4. The Broadman's classification will be dealt in neuroanatomy. Anterior to the primary motor area, we have two other regions. One is the supplementary motor area. And the other area that we have is the premotor cortex. So this premotor cortex and the supplementary motor area, they will modulate the function of the primary motor area. So uh, that's about the motor cortex. And in the frontal cortex, we have other areas such as the Broca's area, frontal eye field and so on that will be relevant when we discuss about stroke or cerebrovascular accidents. Now our pyramidal tract, our pyramidal tract starts from these areas, from the three areas. That is the fibers arise from the primary motor area and then we have fibers from the somatosensory area and from the cortex the fibers from the premotor area and the supplementary cortex, supplementary motor cortex. 
from all these three areas our fibers start descending among these three uh, the primary the somatosensory area is where 40 percentage of the fibers arise from so most of the fibers that is 40 percentage of the fibers actually arise from the somatosensory area in the uh, motor tract this is important because this shows the coordination between the sensory cortex and the motor cortex without this coordination we will not be able to perform our motor activities because motor activities are performed in response to sensory stimulus then the primary motor cortex area will constitute the other 30 percentage whereas the premotor and the supplementary motor area will constitute the remaining 30 percentage so these are the distribution of fibers now from the primary motor cortex area what happens is that these fibers will descend and they will descend along and join the internal capsule so this region is actually the internal capsule and these fibers which are coming out from all the parts all different parts of the uh, sensory uh, of the motor cortex they are called as corona radiata these fibers are known as corona radiata they are radiating fibers that descends downwards and they will join the internal capsule this is our internal capsule which is a compact bundle at the internal capsule all the other fibers that is fibers from the thalamus the uh, fibers from the basal ganglia from the subcortical regions they will also join into the internal capsule and these fibers they will descend down from the cortex from the subcortical area and then they will pass through the midbrain and the midbrain we know that there are three nucleus actually one is our third nucleus and the other one is our fourth nucleus so the fibers that descend through the midbrain these cortico uh, cortical fibers they will also supply the cranial nucleus third and the cranial nucleus four which are associated with our eye movements that is the eclomotor and the uh, trochlear fibers so third and fourth cranial nerves are supplied and then what happens is that they will descend along the pons they'll descend further down and appear on the anterior aspect of the pons at the pons what happens is that the com the bundle gets loosened a bit and in the pons which are the nuclei which are present we know that there are three nuclei that is fifth nucleus and the sixth nucleus a uh, two nuclei are present so there are fibers which go to the fifth and the sixth that is the trigeminal nuclei and the uh, the motor part of trigeminal nucleus and then we have our sixth nucleus which is the abducent nerve nuclei and then it descends further downwards where we reach the medulla and in the medulla they form a compact bundle and that is known by the name of pyramid so it is in the medulla where the pyramid is formed and what happens is that here the fibers take two pathways around 80 percentage of the fibers they decussate and move to the opposite lateral side so that constitutes 80 percentage of the fibers which move decussate and move to the opposite side and they are present laterally and they will descend downwards along the lateral part of the spinal cord and they are called as the lateral corticospinal tract so that constitutes the lateral corticospinal tract which is 80 percentage of the fibers what about the remaining 15 to 20 percentage of the fibers they will descend anteriorly along the same line and they are called as the anterior corticospinal tract which constitutes 15 to 20 percentage now this anterior corticospinal tracts at the level of spinal cord they will synapse so these fibers both these fibers will synapse uh, anterior corticospinal at the anterior aspect and lateral corticospinal tract at the lateral aspect and what happens is that at the level of spinal cord they will end they will end either on the interneurons or they will end directly at the next set of neurons which starts at the spinal cord which are the anterior motor neurons which start at the spinal cord so they start at the anterior part of spinal cord they will leave the anterior root of spinal cord and they will go and innervate our muscles so let's just mark these names so the next set of neurons they are the anterior they begin at the anterior horn cells of the spinal cord and then they will pass through the anterior root of spinal cord or the ventral root of spinal cord then they form our peripheral nerve or the motor nerve which will innervate the muscle so here we have our muscle skeletal muscle and we know that at the point of innervation there is a neuromuscular junction where the nerve gets in contact with the muscle so this is in rough about the corticospinal uh, tract or our pyramidal tract now about the anterior spinal tract which we have discussed the anterior spinal tract when it ends at the anterior horn cell these anterior horn cells they will also decussate to the opposite side and innervate the opposite area so at the end at the level of spinal cord both the lateral and the corticospinal tracts will eventually innervate the opposite side of the body this is an important thing which we need to realize the concept of crossing of fibers to the opposite uh, tract is important when we discuss about stroke because what it means is that if the right side of the tract is involved the left side of our body is affected so that's why we need to realize uh, the importance of this crossing over uh, stroke is the most important topic in neurology and that's what we will discuss next
Stroke is also called by the name cerebrovascular accident. What we need to know at the level of first MDBS is that the stroke occurs due to a dysfunction of the neurons of the central nervous system and it can occur by two mechanisms. Either there could be infarction, that is the death of the neurons due to decreased blood supply or there could be hemorrhage into the CNS that can damage the neurons. Now again the infarction could be due to thrombotic or embolic reasons which is not required at the level of first MBBS. Now here we will identify what happens or what are the type of lesions that are produced when different parts of the tract is injured. To understand that we need to understand another important concept that is a concept of upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron. So what is the upper motor neuron? Everything that we have discussed in this slide that is from the cerebral cortex all the way up to the spinal cord at the level of anterior horn, up to the anterior horn, that entire pathway, that's like a single track, right? It's like a single track without uh, any synapses in between while descending. So that's called as the upper motor neuron, extending from the motor cortex up to the anterior horn cell, which is depicted by the black color track in this figure. Whereas the red color tra track which I have shown below, that is actually our lower motor neuron. So where does our lower motor neuron start? Our lower motor neuron starts from our anterior horn at the level of spinal cord, then we have the anterior root, then the peripheral nerve, the neuromuscular junction and finally the muscle. This idea of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron is really central in neurology because the characteristic features that are produced are different for both UMN and LMN lesions and it's important for us to realize this in neurology. So now with this basis let's move on to the stroke and the type of presentation that occurs when different parts of the uh, pyramidal tract are involved. So let's start with the internal capsule which is the most important part. Suppose that there is a lesion in the internal capsule. So this is the right side of the brain and this is the left side. So when the right internal capsule is affected, what happens? What we need to understand is that the fibers from the corona radiator are scattered and at the, in and at the uh, internal capsule they are densely packed along with the fibers, extra pyramidal fibers and the subcortical thalamic basal ganglia fibers. All of these fibers are densely packed at the internal capsule. Therefore, if an injury occurs at the internal capsule, the whole bundle or the whole pyramidal tract will be affected and it will be destroyed. So what it means is that every tr the, the entire tract below the level of internal capsule will be injured. What does that leave us with? It leaves us with the injury to the entire motor supply to the opposite half of the body. In this case, when the right internal capsule is affected, the entire left half, one half of our body is injured. And this type of presentation is called as hemiplegia. Hemi means an entire half and plegia refers to paralysis. So an internal capsule injury causes hemiplegia. Now the hemiplegia, even though the right tract is involved, the left part of the body is affected. Why is it so? It's because of the crossing which occurs at the level of medulla. Therefore, this type of presentation we call as contralateral. That is when the opposite side is affected, we call it contralateral. Whereas if the same side of the lesion is affected, we call it ipsilateral. In, in internal capsule injury, we have a contralateral hemiplegia. Now the next question is, is it a UMN type of lesion or is it an element type of lesion? Obviously, the lesion uh, occurs in the internal capsule which is mid which is along the pathway from the cortex to the spinal cord therefore this is a umn type of lesion this is how we describe a neurological lesion that is a lesion at an internal capsule produces a umn type of contralateral hemiplegia with that knowledge we now move to the next part that is our brainstem what happens when there is an injury in the brainstem now in the brainstem one more feature is there that is there is um, supply to the cranial nerves at different parts that is third and fourth cranial nerve at the midbrain, 5 and 6 at pons and 7 to 12 cranial nerves are supplied by the pyramidal tract. So suppose there is an injury on this area, that is on the right uh, tract at the level of midbrain. What will happen? We will have just like in the internal capsule, we will have contralateral hemiplegia will be present on the opposite side, that is on the left half of the body, just like in the internal capsule. Along with that, uh, the contralateral hemiplegia will be UMN type. Along with that, we will have the face cranial nerve palsy, right? The third and fourth nerve will be affected. And this third and fourth nerve is actually affected on the right side itself. That is the important point to note. That is when the right tract is affected, the right third and fourth cranial nerve is involved, which means that it is an ipsilateral involvement, not the contralateral, not the opposite side. The same side cranial nerve is involved. So we call it, it's an ipsilateral cranial nerve palsy. Now the question is, is it a UMN type or is it an LMN type? The answer is that this is an element type of cranial nerve palsy. Now why is that so? Reason is that the cranial nerve nucleuses are similar to the anterior horn of spinal cord. Just like how the anterior horn of spinal cord is the first nucleus for the uh, lower motor neuron. In a similar manner, for the nucleus for the cranial nerve is present at the brainstem. As a result, the uh, lesion at the level of brainstem will affect the cranial nerve nuclei giving rise to an element lesion. That is why we have 
element if cilateral cranial nerve calcium in brainstem lesions now with that knowledge we now move on to the remaining two parts that is at the spinal cord at the upper and lower level at the upper level of spinal cord here we are dis, uh, discussing a complete transection not the transection of one side which is called as hemisection which will be dealt in a separate discussion let's assume what happens let's see what happens when the uh, entire upper spinal cord is transected all the fibers that are present below will be affected that is if a lesion occurs at the cervical spinal cord the brachial plexus we know that it is present from c5 to t1 so above c5 if a lesion occurs the entire brachial plexus on both sides will be affected therefore the up, both upper limbs will be affected along with that the fibers sacral lumbar and thoracic fibers will also be affected what will that leave us with that will cause quadriplegia that is all the four limbs will be paralyzed leading to quadriplegia along with that if the lesion occurs above c3 what is the peculiarity we know that diaphragm is supplied by c3 c4 and c5 the diaphragm is supplied by the phrenic nerve which has roots from c3 c4 and c5 so if the lesion is about c3 the diaphragmatic supply is also uh, arrested and as a result that will lead to respiratory failure there will be a respiratory arrest whereas if the lesion is below c5 respiratory arrest will not occur but quadriplegia quadriplegia will be present when it comes to the lower spinal cord that is below the thoracic level the lumbar and sacral plexus will be affected and as a result on both sides the lower limbs will be paralyzed whereas upper limb will be normal this present is called as paraplegia so these are the different types of presentation depending upon the location now there is one more region which we haven't discussed and that is the cerebral cortex the thing about cerebral cortex as we know that cerebral cortex is a diffused area and because of the diffusion of the cerebral cortex only parts of the cerebral cortex will be injured in a stroke and not the entire cortex as a result only some of the fibers of the pyramidal tract will be injured and because of this reason we will not have a complete hemiplegia as in the internal capsule where there are dense involvement of fibers here the fibers are scattered certain specific fibers supplying certain specific parts of our, our body will be injured and those motor regions will be uh, paralyzed therefore we say that cortical involvement causes monoplegia any of the limb or region might be affected depending upon the area of the cortex that has uh, undergone a stroke or have been affected by a cerebrovascular accident now when the cortex is affected the cortex has other areas such as there is a sensory cortex there is an area for speech known as the broca's area there is an area for frontal gaze frontal eye field there are different areas of the cortex depending upon the areas which are involved we'll have other presentations along with the uh, monoplegia such as aphasia the speech area is affected or we'll have seizures and so on these are the features which occur in cortical lesions so that's about stroke Next topic is uh, the motor homunculus it is just like the sensory homunculus that is different parts or different skeletal muscles of our body have specific points in the cortex and like the sensory homunculus the legs lie medially the trunk lies superiorly and lateral to that that we have the hands and fingers with a large area of representation then laterally we have the face and inferiorly and laterally we have the tongue and the areas related to speech such as the pharynx larynx and so on the two important things which we need to know about motor homunculus is one is just like the sensory homunculus it is a topographic representation of different body parts on the motor cortex and the other one is that hands fingers and the speech areas have large representation so those are the two important points that we need to know about motor homunculus we move to the final part of discussion in this video and that is the difference between a human and an element lesion this is where the importance of an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron comes into play so let's begin with the definition we have discussed a human lesion is a lesion anywhere between the cortex up to the spinal cord at the level of anterior horn whereas an element lesion extends starts from the anterior horn up to the muscle along the uh, anterior root peripheral nerve and neuromuscular junction so what are the features of a human lesion the first thing is when a human lesion occurs a tract is involved and as a result a group of muscles are usually involved whereas in contrast to that in element lesions we can think of it as nerve peripheral nerve lesion so we know that peripheral nerve supply a single muscle usually so there will be a single muscle involvement in element lesions next point we need to realize is about the reflexes so let's draw a reflex arc we know that every reflex has an efferent as an integrating center that is a spinal cord and it has an efferent pathway in case of the lower motor ne neurons if there is a lesion at a lower motor neuron what happens is that the efferent pathway of reflexes are blocked for both superficial and deep tendon reflexes the efferent pathway is blocked and as a result we can say that the superficial reflexes and the deep tendon reflexes both are lost in a lower motor neuron when it comes to an upper motor neuron we have the pyramidal tract and along with that we have an extra pyramidal tract both are involved in an upper motor neuron lesion in upper motor neuron lesion the superficial reflexes will be lost 
But to understand what happens to the deep tendon reflexes, we need to know the role of extrapyramidal tracts. So the extrapyramidal tracts, they have an inhibitory effect on the deep tendon reflexes. And when the extrapyramidal tracts are injured, this inhibitory effect is lost. And as a result, there will be increased discharge of the gamma motor neurons involved in the reflexes. And because of that, due to its consequence, the deep tendon reflexes will be exaggerated. It's one of the findings in a UMN lesion. The other point is regarding the muscle wasting. When it comes to muscle wasting, the complete muscle is in disuse in an element lesion leading to muscle wasting or a disuse atrophy because all the reflexes are lost and the nerve supply is cut. Whereas when it comes to the, uh, in a UMN lesion, the reflexes, the deep tendon reflexes are still intact and the muscle has torn. As a result, there is minimal wasting of muscles in a UMN lesion. Now we see that there are differences between UMN and element lesions. This is why it's important for us to know about them. About the torn of the muscles. In, a UM, in an LMN lesion, there is going to be a hypotonia and we call it as flaccid paralysis, flaccidity of the muscles. Whereas when it comes to UMN lesion, there will be hypertonia. The mechanism for hypertonia is same as that for the deep tendon reflexes. That is the inhibitory effect of extrapyramidal tracts will be lost uh, on the muscle tone. And as a result, there will be hypertonia and muscle spasms. And we call this as spastic paralysis. Despite all of these features, the most striking difference or the characteristic finding which differentiate between a UMN and an LMN lesion is the Babinski sign. In a UMN lesion, the Babinski sign is positive, whereas in an LMN lesion, the Babinski sign is negative. The Babinski sign is actually uh, based on the Babinski's reflex that happens when we stroke the sole of our foot with a tactile stimulus. When if the fanning of toes occurs, we call the Babinski sign as positive, whereas if it does not occur, we call it as negative. The Babinski's reflex is associated with our ability to walk. It is because of a negative Babinski sign that we are able to walk. In a UMN lesions, that is lost and as a result, the sign becomes positive. All of the other signs may change at some points, especially in the initial stages after a UMN lesion, there may be a stage of shock. And in those conditions, the deep tendon reflexes might be lost in a UMN lesion and there might be hypotony of the muscles, contrary to what we have discussed so far. But if the Babinski sign is positive, that definitely indicates a UMN lesion. There is a physiological area where the Babinski sign is positive, and that is in infants. That is, in children below the age of one, the pyramidal system is not developed uh, completely, and as a result, the Babinski sign will be positive. That is why these children cannot walk as well. That is one of the reasons why children below one years of age cannot walk. So that's about UMN versus LMN, and that's what we'll discuss that's all that